Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thanks for that. <laughs> so one object that you won't find in any museum collection, at least not in the design section, is the breast pump. Uh, the best examples of breast pumps that I could find in any museum uh, collections, I went fishing to see what I could find, were a 1920s glass pump from the health and medical equipment section of the Powerhouse Museum of Applied Arts and Sciences object just there and then I also found a 1793 engraving from the rare book section of the welcome collection a collection that deals largely with sort of medical anthropology and that's all I could find and that's because the design of the breast pump really sucks but you know what product is more primed for our connected and quantified future than the breast pump particularly in the US where limited maternity leave seems to make it an inescapable part of being a mother so the next speakers in this morning's session, Alexei Hope and Catherine Ignacio, are co-organizers of the Make the Breast Pump Not Suck hackathon at MIT, which happened sort of late last year and got a lot of press attention as well. The hackathon responded to the headline of a blog post on the Times Motherload blog asking, shouldn't the breast pump be as elegant as an iPhone and as quiet as a Prius by now? Uh, <laughs> pretty far from that so um, and I guess my personal connection to this is I had uh, twins who are now two years old but they were born a couple of months prematurely so even though I had really extensive maternity leave there was definitely a period where I was connected to that pump and then moving to the US and working in New York now it's been really interesting to see how much sort of lactation rooms and pumping and everything are actually a part of the working everyday experience for American women here in the US. So the, the uh, hackathon definitely got my attention when I saw coverage of it. So Alexi is a designer and researcher studying at the MIT Media Lab and the Center for Civic Media. And prior to joining the lab, uh, Alexi worked on a multi-year project to design, build, and test a portable ultrasound machine for midwives in low-resource environments. Um, and this project included field work and co-design with midwives, radiologists, and mothers in Kenya, Uganda, and Seattle. So on another occasion, I'd love to know more about that project. And Catherine is an artist, software developer, and educator. She's the director of the Institute for Infinitely Small Things. Uh, she offered the performance of John Cage's, uh, Cage's uh, Silence uh, later this evening. Um, and her artwork has been exhibited at the ICA Boston, IBEAM, and Mass Mocha, and she was formerly director of the Experimental Geography Research Cluster at uh, RISD's Design and Digital MFA program. So Alexi and Catherine are here to tell us about how they shaped an inclusive and critical makerspace. Hi there, uh, my name is Alexis Hope, and this is... And hi, Catherine Dignazio. Uh, so we're here to tell you a little bit about the Make the Breast Pump Not Suck Hackathon that we held in September this year at the MIT Media Lab. Uh, this was an effort to have a critical conversation through making. Uh, so there's seven of us in total who organized the event. So uh, many of us are parents, and we're all MIT students or affiliates, and together we're engineers, artists, and designers. Um, so uh, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure, uh, this is a breast pump. Um, breastfeeding and breast milk are recognized as the superior way to feed your baby. Um, there are official guidelines about this. The American Academy of Pediatricians uh, promotes at least one year of um, nursing or, or pumping to feed your baby. The World Health Organization um, advocates for two years of, of feeding your baby breast milk. Um, oops. Um, and um, and so the breast pump is a machine that is made for extracting breast milk when a mother or a trans dad cannot be physically present for their baby. Um, and so the way that it works is that you go somewhere, somewhere <laughs> you go somewhere private, ideally not a bathroom floor, but occasionally. Um, you hold these cone-shaped things uh, to your breasts. Uh, you turn on the motor. Uh, and the thing 
sucks out milk, which then you store in bottles and uh, put in a fridge and at a later date, ideally, feed to your baby. Um, so the thing sucks, literally, it works with vacuum. Um, and it also sucks figuratively as well. It is nothing like the kind of warm, cuddly experience of actually nursing a baby and, and um, sort of getting this wonderful, amazing. Um, so, so the machine sucks, uh, literally. Uh, it works through vacuum technology, and it also sucks figuratively. Um, so it's nothing like the warm and cuddly experience of, of holding another human being and um, giving them nourishment and food from your own body, which is like a really amazing thing. Um, this is a very medical experience. You look at this, it looks like a medical device. The flanges, those horn thingies, are cold, they're hard, they're plastic. Um, it's hard to relax and do this. You have to pitch yourself forward so that the milk goes, goes into the, uh, the bottle thingy. There's a ton of little um, fussy parts, and if you forget one part and you are away from your home, the thing doesn't work. Um, the most systems are not hands-free, so you have to actually be like holding these things like this and doing this. Um, and then finally, there's the terrible, awful noise of being milked uh, by a machine, <laughs> um, which f I don't know why they haven't managed to fix that one yet. Um, so if you think it's not very advanced, that's because it's not. Um, and so the basic de design of the device hasn't changed. Um, Fiona showed that great image. This is basically kind of a similar image. It hasn't changed. We actually found the patent since 1914. Um, basic, uh, same technology. Um, yet, at the same time, breast pumps save lives. Um, and so this is particularly the case for babies who are born prematurely and uh, are in the NICU unit of hospitals um, where they actually haven't been able to, their mouths haven't yet developed to where they can latch onto the breasts. Um, they can, uh, a mother or trans dad can pump milk and then you can feed a baby through the tube. Um, and this is, I mean, so preemies don't get fed formula ideally because there's a recognized um, sort of medicinal, amazing, sort of life-saving value of breast milk at this, for this particular use case. Um, and then the other very common use case for the breast pump is women who are returning to work. Um, and so although there are these like clear public health guidelines, as I was explaining about this, the non-existent family leave policy in countries such as the U.S., um, makes it extremely difficult for families to meet those recommendations. Um, and so this is a public health issue. Um, and moreover, it's really a public issue. Um, it's not just something to, me to, to be negotiated by an individual woman in, and her machine in a private lactation closet away from society. Um, so um, th here's the story. So this is the, this is the kind of story that... Um, that brought our group together at the MIT Media Lab. We, uh, the New York Times Motherhood blog published this article about, you know, why don't we have a breast pump as elegant as an iPhone and as quiet as a Prius? Um, and so a number of students at the MIT Media Lab, um, women and men, are parents and new parents and parents-to-be. And we started meeting informally as a little group and saying, man, we're like at the MIT Media Lab. Like, we are in a position to do something about this. Um, and at first, when we started coming together, we were thinking, like, it's going to be us who invents the next pump. So we were, like, in, you know, imagining all sorts of, like, a warm pump, a pump where you can lay down, all this stuff. And then increasingly, as we um, brought in the conversation and started meeting with midwives and nurses and lactation consultants and end users, it became really clear that this was a larger public conversation. There was space here to catalyze a larger um, force of creativity and innovation that wouldn't just come out of our small group. Uh, so, so after we did some initial efforts uh, with our group, we publicized some of that on a blog, and it got a lot of attention um, on social media, and a lot of emails kept pouring in, and so we thought there would be a way to include a larger set of people in the conversation. So we decided to stage a large public hackathon at the lab. Uh, so we had lots of critical, a lot of goals that we wanted to address through making. So for sure we wanted to critique the object itself, uh, but we also wanted to critique a culture that prioritized smart dog bowls over quieter breast pumps. So that was a big part of our goal. Uh, and also we wanted to uh, stage a little bit of an intervention into the MIT Media Lab culture as well. Uh, so the lab has kind of been at the forefront in innovation rhetoric and about inventing the future. 
but we wanted to create a new space for people who normally don't get to sit at the table uh, for conversations about technology design. Um, so one of the amazing things when we, we first wrote up some of our activities on the Media Labs blog is that hundreds and hundreds of people reached out to us over email with their, their creative ideas for how they wanted to see the breast pump improve um, and their stories of frustration and, and what their relationship was like with their breast pump. Um, and hundreds of people, all the emails sort of ended with thank you. So there were all these people saying thank you for addressing this issue, like even just bringing attention to this issue as being a thing in the first place. Um, and so that outpouring of creativity on the part of, you know, kind of these people we had never met really became central to our design of the larger hackathon event. Um, and so we saved all of those ideas. We've actually created an open source repository on GitHub of all of those ideas. Um, and they became, and we hung them on the wall at the hackathon. Um, and had, we had people at the hackathon highlighting them. And then we also had, um, we actually tied the judging of criteria of the hackathon to having to engage with these stories and noting which problems your solution addressed out of these stories. Uh, so we really didn't know what kinds of things we're gonna, people were going to build going into it, so we just tried to get a variety of different materials. So we had lots of electronic equipment, we had tubes and connectors, we had fabrics for soft prototyping, we had 3D printers, and then full access to the Media Lab shop, uh, cardboard and paper for prototyping. And we also had um, a lot of people who reached out to us prior to the event in the Boston area who couldn't make it to the hackathon, uh, but still wanted a way to participate. So we had a lot of donated breast pumps. We had a collection bin in the atrium of the Media Lab where people could drop off their breast pumps. And uh, that also started a lot of conversations within the lab itself of, hey, what's that box and what is a breast pump? And that was, again, part of our goal. Uh, so hackathons normally draw a large, uh, largely male, young, and childish pop population. Uh, maybe that's because if you're expected to stay overnight at an event, probably aren't the type of person who has to put a kid to bed, and there's probably not childcare options at that hackathon. So parents don't usually go to these types of events. Uh, so we wanted our hackathon to be a unique space for parents to uh, create while also caring for their children. So we encourage them to bring uh, their children and also their partner or a friend to care for them um, if they liked. So we also had a lactation room, a nursing area, a kid's play area, lots of toys, and plenty of snacks. And uh, so it was really a common sight to see people caring for their children and also um, working on their creative ideas at the same time. And we're pretty sure we had a Guinness World Record for the number of babies at a hackathon. <laughs> um, and so we tried to be equally inclusive of moms and dads and partners. Um, and so often breastfeeding is seen as this thing that is only the mom and the baby's thing. Um, but we really feel, and there's actually research to support this idea that partners and dads and the support of an extended family and community have a huge difference in how long moms and babies will, will continue to nurse. Um, so these amazing teams formed at the hackathon. This is, um, this is an example of one of the most amazing teams. Um, we were very inspired by, well, we did have prizes. There were um, financial prizes at the hackathon. Um, people did not seem to be motivated by that at all. So this was a team that formed, they were called Second Nature. They had um, 30 people on their team. Um, they had an amazing level of organization for all just having met each other. They formed like four subcommittees. Um, each of the subcommittees was designing uh, a different aspect of the system for how a breast, a breast pump could more accurately mimic the sucking of an infant. Um, so they were building like a tongue and a stomach and all of these amazing things. Um, Another uh, really uh, standout team was the Helping Hands team, uh, which they actually are continuing to, to work today. Uh, they were building a system that was based on compression rather than vacuum technology, and that's actually what you do when you manually extract breast milk is, is by squeezing. So they were developing a kind of bread, blood pressure um, cuff-like bra to actually extract breast milk. Uh, so I mentioned we tried to be prepared 
for anything with all the materials we ordered, but people did really surprising, innovative things with stuff they brought with them from home. So this is from the team that's trying to mimic, mimic the way a baby actually sucks. So this is part of the baby's tongue mechanism. They brought these balloons and fashioned this up, and we, this is something we didn't expect. And a lot of people were using unconventional materials that they brought with them or found around the lab to make stuff. Um, I also mentioned that we had uh, breast pumps that were donated by the, the wider public, but we also had our sponsor companies also were very gracious and donated lots of their pumps for people to take apart and hack and do whatever they wanted with. So here's some people putting a software control layer on top of this uh, common pump so that you can basically make it do anything you want and it provides a layer of control that currently doesn't exist. And our sponsors were really very surprisingly cool about letting people do whatever they wanted with their equipment. Um, so as we said, uh, one of our goals was to take something seen as being private, individual, female thing, and then use the platform and the context of the MIT Media Lab to have a more public conversation. Um, so it was also simultaneously a kind of media intervention as well. Um, and the hackathon generated a huge amount of press in the US context in particular. And what out, most outlets seemed to focus on was that MIT, seen as kind of a center for uh, male-oriented technology and engineering culture, was focusing its energy on a design object as seemingly mundane and private and female-oriented as the breast pump. So this got written up in Forbes, The New Yorker, CNN, Fast Company. It was discussed on TV and the radio, on BBC World News, <clears throat> NPR, CBC, WNYC. And it went viral on social media uh, where users, there were a lot of diverse reactions, but users applauded the effort. People offered their ideas in many on many platforms and forums and emailed us. Um, they criticized the winners of the hackathon uh, vociferously once, once they got announced. They debated about whether breast pumps should or should not suck by definition. Um, and generally just um, sort of exploded in the, the weeks prior and then a little bit after following the hackathon. So these are some of the design principles that guided uh, the design of the hackathon. So I'm not going to go into these in detail, but we're currently writing up an academic paper that's going to talk a little bit more about the design and impact of the hackathon itself. Um, but we're happy to talk about these during the Q&A a little bit later. Um, so as probably most everyone in the audience knows, hackathons get criticized for failing to produce real world impact. And so one of the things that we're trying to do post hackathon is really track what happened as a result and to help shepherd efforts forward. So we really see our, our shift as organizers kind of went more into this support um, uh, and community kind of stewarding and maintenance mode. And so that's sort of where we are now. Um, but just quickly, there are some really awesome and amazing things that emerged from the hackathon that are continuing to sort of flourish. So three of the winning teams merged to form a, one sort of super team that has now submitted their prototype into the MIT 100K Accelerator, where they stand to win a good chunk of cash to take it to the next level. They also have VC interest, so they, are, they have banded together, and they're really, they're really pursuing this to the next level. They're very serious about it. Um, there are a number of Media Lab students have taken it on in classes, and so there's actually a class that produced an open source Arduino-powered breast pump. Um, classes have taken on the challenge. There were a couple of momentous personal decisions that came out of the hackathon. So one woman actually decided to return to school for mechanical engineering as a, re a direct result of participating in the hackathon. Um, we are making the data visible. So we're doing a, a data story right now for the New York Times, actually, on what people want from their breast pump. And writing a research paper. And our next sort of thing as organizers is that we're working with the MIT Hacking Medicine Group to organize a maternal health a track on their large spring health hackathon um, that we expect to have over 500 participants. So we're trying to keep that momentum going and kind of keep bringing more people into the conversation. Um, just a shout out to our sponsors. Uh, like Alexa said, they were super cool about us hacking their breast pumps and talking about how much they sucked the whole time. <laughs> and that's, that's it. <laughs>